Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about all things paddleboarding. Everything from how to know that you've got the right permissions, insurance, training for endurance and long distance, types of kit that you need, equipment. But before we get started, I would say if you enjoy this video today, then I'd really appreciate it if you could either like or subscribe or both to my channel and support these videos that I'm creating. It really would mean a lot and it's hugely appreciated. Over the last couple of weeks, I've had so many questions come through on my Instagram from lots of people that are planning to go out since lockdown has been lifted and want some tips and advice on the best way of doing that. There's also a lot of people that are planning some really big endurance challenges this year, which is exciting, particularly across the English Channel, so I hope I can give you a bit more insight into that as well. Okay, so let's get cracking with the first question. So, I get cramp in my feet when paddleboarding. Is it just me? Do you have any tips? Cramp in your feet when you're paddleboarding is pretty common when you're a beginner. It's basically because you are trying to create stability on the board by gripping your toes onto it and that's causing your legs to fatigue. The best thing you can try and do, very simply, is relax. And the more relaxed you are on the board, you're, the less your feet are going to be gripping. And often you're doing it completely subconsciously, you don't even realise. Just give your board a little bit of a rock side to side, get really comfortable with the movement on it and just kind of realise that it's way more steady and stable than you actually think and then once you've started to get a bit more confidence on the board you'll find that that tension and those cramps that you're feeling will slowly start to alleviate but also having a good stance is really helpful so your feet sort of shoulder width apart quite wide the wider your feet as a beginner the more stability you will feel on the board so just putting these little things into practice when you're out on the water should be really helpful for that do you keep your board inflated would you suggest an electric pump? I don't keep my board inflated purely because of space. I live in a little flat, so keeping it in my flat would take up pretty much all the room I have. Um, so every time I go out, I inflate it and then deflate it at the end. I have used electric pumps before on plastic patrol cleanups because we're pumping up 15 to 16 boards in a couple of hours. I would say though, if you are going out to do a paddle and you've just got the one board to pump up, it's actually a really good warm up. Um, I know when you're trying to get it up to sort of like 18 psi, that last little bit can be quite tough, but I think it's a really good way just to activate a lot of the muscles you're going to be using. So if you've got a lot of boards to pump up, I can understand why you want an electric pump. But if you're just doing it for yourself to make things a bit easier and quicker, often it's not much quicker. Than actually just doing it on your own and it's a really good way of just getting your body kind of moving and uh, ready for a paddle as well so don't be lazy what's the best board for a beginner or a good starting board good question and people ask me this a lot about the types of boards that they need so i would say for a beginner just an all-round board something quite wide about 30 inches is pretty good the wider it is the more stable you're going to feel and between about 10 and 11 foot as well but obviously for a lot of people the choice of board that they make will be very dependent on price honestly i think it's really worth looking online on facebook forums and groups to see if people are getting rid of their beginner boards um, as they upgrade onto sort of more advanced boards or at the end of the sub season say end of september beginning of october a lot of clubs will sell off some of their old kits and you could probably find a good deal there. The reason being is that it's really easy to outgrow a beginner board. Over even just a few months, if you're out quite often on the water, it will slowly start to become quite sluggish um, and you'll know when you're ready to upgrade to something more advanced. So I would say don't spend a lot of money buying something brand new as a beginner and wait until you're a bit more confident and a bit more advanced on the water and invest a bit more on a better board when you go for sort of a more intermediate advanced level but definitely where you can i would say go and use a second hand board do you use uv protection on your paddle board i personally don't use uv protection on my paddle board i never have and that's just my choice for me if it's sunny and hot then and i'm not paddling then i'll just put my board in the shade or cover it up one thing I do do is just release a little bit of the um, of the air, reduce the PSI a little bit. 
um but otherwise it's really down to what you want to do if you want to put some protection on there i don't see it's a problem um i don't think it damages the board in any way but it's just not something i've done so i can't really give huge amounts of advice on that okay what are your favorite paddle boarding clothes to wear my paddle boarding clothing choices are probably a little bit unorthodox but i'll tell you what i do anyway so in terms of my footwear i love paddle boarding bare feet even when it gets a bit colder i've kind of just become immune to the cold really i think with it apart from when it's freezing that's different i always wear booties but we'll come on to that um, but when it's warm and it's kind of bearable temperatures I just really like the feeling of my feet being rooted on that board and like sometimes the water being on them. It just makes me feel more connected to nature and I just feel more stable on the board. It's just what I've always done and what I'm really comfortable with. And I know a lot of people also enjoy paddling that way. When we do our plastic patrol cleanups, I ask people just to come in trainers. So something with a bit of a grip that they don't mind getting wet. The time that I think it's a bit different and you really need good solid footwear is in winter because when it starts to get really cold the first thing to go are your feet and your fingers and as soon as they're cold it's game over you might as well just go back because you're just cold through and you can't warm up again and it's only going to get worse so make sure that you've got really good neoprene uh, booties about maybe five mil thick for winter paddling um, and the same for gloves as well, if you can get some good gloves. Otherwise, I'm a barefoot convert, so I'll always tell you that's my favourite. And you haven't got to buy any equipment, it's free. Generally, I like really loose, breathable clothing, and um, I, don't, I don't think there's very much out there specifically for the paddleboarding community. And when I'm doing sort of long distance endurance paddles, and I have to wear a wetsuit, I find that it really chafes under my arms and it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, so providing the weather's quite warm and the water temperature isn't too cold, I will always opt for gym wear more than anything. Like I don't have any special, um, any special gear that I've bought particularly for just casual paddles. It's just loose fitting, light, um, tops and, and leggings so how do you train for a long distance paddle pack in the miles there is no better training for endurance paddling than going on the water and paddling for a long time because you're just building up that muscle memory with every stroke you're taking it's the same with any sport if you're training for a marathon you are running and running and running in the months leading up to that. Where you can, replicate the conditions that you're expecting to find. So if you're going to do a long distance paddle on the ocean, try and do your training paddle in those same conditions. If you're going to do something inland on a river or canal, replicate on there as well. In terms of gym work, core is a massive part of it. A lot of people ask about arms and abs. Actually, what you need to be really focusing on is your glutes. A lot of um, where you're activating from and a lot of the power in your strokes and your paddles is actually coming from from your butt not from your arms your arms are just kind of anchors they're just hooks so that you can make that paddle movement but actually generating power is coming from the biggest muscles in your body from your bum um, so yeah lots of squats probably for that one but generally just all round strength and conditioning is really important gym work but I would say over anything it's just getting out on the water and just getting comfortable with the environment that you're going to be in. Why does paddle boarding look so much easier than it is? <laughs> Probably because you're looking at Instagram and on Instagram everybody puts up pictures of them standing and smiling often with crystal clear waters and white sandy beaches and it makes paddle boarding look very relaxing and very aspirational and sometimes it is that but when you start throwing in tides and currents and wind speed and wind direction and everything else that could possibly make paddling a bit harder all of a sudden it becomes a much more challenging experience and i think the great thing about paddle boarding is it can be as easy and as difficult as you want it to be it can be as slow and as fast as you want it to be i i think it's easy and it's accessible for a lot of people but i definitely think that there is a little bit of misconception around how easy it really is where do you get access point information when you're discovering a new route? 
that's a really good question and there's no one single way of doing it I'll either go and recce that location first and find somewhere that I can park and that I know I can get on the water. If recceing somewhere isn't really possible, Google Satellite View is really useful because you can get a really great understanding of kind of what's going on around that particular body of water. Speaking to local paddling groups or finding communities online in that area that you're looking to go to can be really useful and give really good tips and advice about how to how to find somewhere to launch. I think that's one of the hardest parts is when you're trying to find new places is where you can legally and safely access the water from. Okay. Joining clubs versus casual sup, what are the pros and cons? I cannot recommend enough that everybody who is a beginner paddler joins a club before they buy a board and casually paddle. The reason I say this is because the earlier question that we had is why does it look so much easier than it is? There is a massive misconception around how easy paddle boarding is and I see all the time people out in conditions that they shouldn't be in, holding the paddle wrong way round, without the right kit and equipment on, their postures all wrong, their techniques terrible and they're in quite dangerous conditions but they just don't realise it because they haven't done any formal training beforehand. The rise of these challenger boards, these really cheap boards that you can get has meant that people have just kind of gone online and bought something and then they'll just take it out to the local river and off they go. I just, I don't think it's the safest way of doing it. And I think as this sport grows, we have a responsibility to make sure that it grows safely. And if you're going to be paddle boarding, then learn how to do it properly from people that are qualified and can teach you. That's what instructors and schools are there for. It's great to go out on your own and casually paddle. And once the basic foundations are in place, by all means, go and explore. But also when you go to a club, you're entering into a really amazing community of people that are also paddlers that can give you tips and advice on what to wear, what to buy, where to paddle, all the things that basically you're asking me now. And there's people there that I'm sure would love to come on your casual paddling adventures with you as well and explore with you. So it's a great way to meet new friends and um, sort of turn your hobby into something a bit more sociable as well. What are the rules to paddle boarding in London? Can I paddle anywhere? The short answer is no, you cannot just paddle board anywhere in London or anywhere in the country. There's a lot of private waterways around this country that aren't under the jurisdiction of the Canal River Trust Environment Agency and other more well-known water authorities. So you really do need to go online and do a bit of research before you start paddling somewhere new. A lot of the canals in London are managed by the Canal River Trust. So providing you're insured, they're generally fine to paddleboard on. Please make sure you've done your research on where to paddle and that you're not accessing private waterways without the required permissions. In London, you've obviously got the River Thames and that's a huge, quite volatile body of water. It's got a big tidal range. There's a lot of boat traffic on there and there's something called the Tideway Code that you need to stick to if you're going to use it. So there's two qualifications that you can get for paddleboarding on the Thames the TSK level one and the TSK level two. The TSK level one will allow you to paddle down to as far as Putney Bridge and the TSK level two will allow you to paddle down as far as Chelsea Bridge. And it's really important that you've got these right qualifications because they've been developed under the guidance of the Port of London Authority who managed that stretch of the Thames and it is tidal and it is dangerous. It's beautiful and it's an amazing way to see the very heart of London, but it doesn't come without its risks. So you can't just like blow your board up and off you go down that stretch of the river. You really do need to make sure that you've got the right equipment, skills, qualifications in place before you do that. How to crack a pivot turn without falling off. I wish I knew the answer. I wish I was so good that I felt confident to give amazing, advice on that particular question all i can say is practice and keep practicing but also put your um put your foot your back foot as far back on the board as possible if you've got a race board or a slightly longer board like a touring board it is harder to lift that nose out of the water so you need more weight on the back than you probably realize to get that lift off the front once you've got that lift off the front it is much easier to make that to make that pivot
We have our own boards, where's the best places to go in London? I really love Regent's Canal, particularly around the Little Venice area. I think it's just beautiful and it's where I've spent a lot of my time paddling. I don't want to do a shameless plug, however, this is my book and it is a guidebook to paddleboarding around the UK. It includes, I think, three routes around London, my favourite ones, which are um, Regent's Canal, which I've just mentioned, but also a route around Richmond and Kingston on the Thames, which is beautiful. It gives all information about access rights, full routes that you can paddle, all of the details, how to get there, if there's anywhere that you can take hires or do lessons in the area, where you can even stay and eat if it's not somewhere that, you, that is local to you. So I do really recommend um, buying it or borrowing it from somebody and just giving you a bit of inspiration about not just where to go, but how you can plan for your own adventures too. I mean, I've paddled a lot around this country, so, it's really been amazing to be able to share it with people that are equally as excited to, as me to explore what's on our doorstep and make the most of it and just see this country from an entirely new perspective. I think that's one of the really amazing things about paddleboarding. If you do want some inspiration and tips, then I will put a link to my book in the notes below as well so you can uh, find out more about that. Final question, best place to paddleboard in the UK? I am a massive fan of the Isles of Scilly. I just think they're beautiful. If you don't know where they are, it's just a cluster of little islands just at the end of Cornwall. It's like being in the Caribbean. It's just absolutely magic. It's crystal clear waters, white sandy beaches. Because it's situated on the Gulf Stream, it exists within its own kind of microclimate. So you've got these gorgeous palm trees that are just lining some of the beaches. Actually, there is a couple of routes in my book for that as well. But yeah, truly for me, I've been going to the Isles of Scilly since I was really small. I try and get out there every year. My dad lives over there and I've got a lot of family over there and friends. And it's just somewhere that I think is truly magical. So that is pretty much all of your questions answered now um oh no one last one tell us about the channel crossing i don't think many people know it's the world's busiest shipping lane yeah i don't think many people do know that it's the world's busiest shipping lane and when you're out there crossing that shipping lane it is very intimidating i had to wait three weeks for a weather window to cross the english channel because it's so temperamental out there and it's kind of got its own microclimate. So that was really tough because you're kind of building yourself up for it and then like the night before you think you're going to be crossing, you're told that you can't because the weather's changed or it's not safe enough or whatever. So mentally gearing up for it was definitely quite a big part of the challenge. I also struggled with the fact that a lot of people were basing my ability to complete that challenge on their assumption of my ability as a paddler and that really knocked my confidence. When I blocked out the noise from other people and I focused on what I knew I was capable of, I felt fine, I felt really in control and I felt really confident. And as, But as soon as I allowed people to share their thoughts and their insights, it really made me doubt myself. So if you are thinking of doing a really big endurance challenge, definitely seek out advice but be really selective over who you let inform you and whose information you take on board because a lot of people give advice out without really knowing your abilities and also your determination like it's not just a physical thing it's definitely a mental thing as well and people often don't account for that but physically in terms of the channel crossing i mean yeah it was really demanding i had a support boat because you're not allowed to cross the English Channel legally without a support boat. Once you enter French waters, you're not by law allowed to be on those shipping lanes in an unmotorized craft. So I had to get onto the boat, get out of the shipping lane on the French side, and then get back into the water and make up the distance on the other side. And it's about three or four miles. The bit that I found most strange and surreal was paddling away from land because it's so counterintuitive to everything that you're taught as a paddle boarder. Often when you're paddling there's something in the distance that you can focus on and you, you feel like you're getting closer and closer to that end goal. When you're crossing the English Channel you don't have the luxury of having anything to pinpoint yourself on. There's just a horizon which is incredible and very grounding to see the horizon 
but it doesn't make you feel like you're actually getting anywhere. I mean, I could talk for hours about the English Channel and all of the challenges that I've done um, and give you more of my thoughts and tips and advice on those. So maybe that's what we can do in another video. But for now, I think that's all of your questions answered. I really hope you found this helpful and insightful and there's things that you can take away from here to make your paddling a bit easier, a bit better. Um, if there's anything else you want information on, let me know, I'm happy to answer any further questions. And yeah, if you've enjoyed this video, I really would appreciate it if you could comment below, like it, subscribe, all the things that you're meant to do. And that's it, thank you very much. See you next time.